saw this, was like, oh my god, ah! Bought it, read it, didn't like it. That's so upsetting. Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. I hope you are well. Today, we're gonna be filling our lives with negativity. <laughs> You gotta do what you gotta do. We're joined by the queen of negativity, Rora, the most vicious cat. The you're not really grumpy. You just you just don't take any shit. So today we're going to be going through my most disappointing books that I've read. These are all really really popular books, I would say, and I basically hated all of them. I did not enjoy my reading experience at all. This video is inspired because I literally just read a book that I hated, that I thought I was gonna love. I don't wanna speak about it yet because it's gonna be in this weekend's vlog, so make sure you hit the bell button so you know when I'm posting that vlog. I don't wanna spoil anything, but it was bad and I'm really sad about it. <laughs> so I thought we would reminisce on all the other books that I was severely disappointed by and that still to this day, I'm like, why couldn't you just be better? So the first book that was incredibly disappointing, that I hated, I think I gave this about 1.5, two stars, something like that. I don't think you're ready for this. I've never really fully spoken on my channel about how I hated this book, because I'm not ready for the hate, but it's Red, White and Royal Blue by Casey McQuiston. I was like, oh my God. That shit took me, caught me off guard. I did not expect it. I was chilling at home. So this was one of the most hyped romances ever. I believe it won like the Goodreads Choice Awards for romance. Everyone and their mum loves it. I hated it. For me, and I, I know a few people have shared this feeling, the Prince Henry, of oh, this is a relationship you don't know between the son of the President of the United States and a Prince of England. And he is like, <laughs> Obviously what the author thinks is stereotypically English and I'm not a Brit who's like Oh my god I love the royal family I don't and I'm not someone who's like Oh my god we don't talk like that <laughs> But like we don't talk like that <laughs> For me Henry just felt like such a caricature that because this book is literally just their relationship, it's not really about anything else. If I feel like one of the people in this relationship isn't a real person, I'm not gonna be interested in this romance. Like I can't connect to you as a couple if I feel like one of you isn't a real believable character. And I didn't feel like Henry was that. Do you see how that's incredibly offensive? Yes, I do, that's why I said it. He spoke in a way that was very old fashioned, which I don't think is realistic when you look at our current royal family. I feel like it would have been so much more interesting if he had been like a wild rebellious prince like Harry, Prince Harry was back in the day. I feel like that would have been such a cool dynamic that we could have gone down but instead he was just so stereotypical of what you think of when you think of like a 20th, 19th century prince. It was sometimes also very unclear in the sex scenes whether sex had actually occurred. I don't mind fade to black sex scenes, but this book would get you so like into the sex scenes and then it would stop. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Then it would be fade to black. And I think it needs to be one or the other. You either need to go all out and not be afraid to go all out, or it just needs to be fade to black and you don't need to get us like so invested in those scenes because it would be all the foreplay would be very much in detail and then it would just stop and I'm like what is going on here either give me it all or give me nothing go ahead girl give us nothing you know because all they're gonna do is disappoint me this or fucking point me when I when I read a book and it has a fade to black sex scene I don't mind that but they don't of they don't get you into the moment, into the sexy times, <laughs> and then pull the plug. Pull the plug. <laughs> Ew, that was rude and weird. Another thing I hated about this was that it felt like the last 100 pages could have been cut. We had like four end scenes. You know in a, in a book, in any book, <laughs> Have you heard of this thing called a book? <laughs> they have that big end scene where like everything is resolved and whatever. But this had four of them 
And every time I was like, we can be done now. Like, we don't need any more. And it would f suddenly find a minor plot point that we had, you know, mentioned on page 90. Like, let's resolve that. I'm like, I don't care anymore. Just shut up. Just shut up. I don't understand why everyone loves it. I think it is a bit of a UK-US divide. I don't think I'm the target audience for this book. And that's okay. But I hated it. <laughs> I really hated it. Now, the next one is kind of a whole series. But I'm particularly going to talk about the last in the series. Series, which was Ruin and Rising by Lee Bardugo. So this is basically the whole Shadow and Bone series was a big disappointment, but I feel like it gets progressively worse <laughs> as it goes on. So the first Lee Bardugo I ever read was Ninth House and I loved it. I know a lot of people didn't love that, but I thought, oh my God, that is so good. One of my favorite fantasies. Maybe it was too ahead of its time for certain people. I wasn't particularly hyped to read this, but I was the kind of person who wanted to read the trilogy before I got into Six of Crows and Crooked Kingdom. I've still got really high hopes for the duology, but this trilogy ain't shit. I would still encourage reading it. Like I'm, I would still encourage reading it. <laughs> because I think it does set you up in the world. Well, actually it doesn't. I don't feel like the world is very vivid in this trilogy. So actually, I don't know if you need to put yourself through it like I did. So in this series, we follow Alina, as I'm sure many of you know, and she finds out she is like the sun summoner. Am I, I don't even remember anything, but it's basically her being able to be a human torch. And then there's someone called the Darkling. He's in charge of darkness, as I'm sure you can imagine. And it's essentially the story of their back and forth, of her figuring out whether she wants to be with a dark overlord or whether she wants to be with like, you know, a normal guy. It hasn't got a strong identity. It hasn't got a strong plot. This one was particularly disappointing because I started the audiobook actually. I didn't really read this physically. And I think the narrator was great. If you are gonna read them, I would actually really recommend the audiobooks because I think they really enhance the reading experience. I think this book would have been rated even lower had I not listened to the audiobook. So I would definitely recommend them. I think the narrator is great. However, nothing happened. I could not tell you I actually can't tell you a single thing that happened in this book. This was such a disappointment. I was really hoping that the last one in the series would be my favourite and it would be redeeming and I'd be in love with it. And because it's the last one, it's the most recent of the trilogy of her writing, of course, because it's the last one. I was just like, oh, okay, this is gonna be the one. And the thing with all of the books in this series, the first 80 pages are really strong. And all three of them, the first 80 pages are so strong and then it just loses it until the end scene at the end. And you're like, what is happening? So when I started this and I read the first like 20%, I was like, wow, we've done it. We've, <laughs> we've done it. I was like, oh my God, this is it. Finally, this series is, you know, worth something. And then we lost it. You did your best, but I guess your best wasn't good enough. The next book, oh my god, I could cry thinking about what a disappointment this was. And it is Vengeful by V.E. Schwab. I have the Barnes & Noble exclusive signed edition. And like, this is one of my first signed copies. I mean, now it's like, you know, the norm. <laughs> But at the time I was just getting into collecting and buying books and I was like, oh my god, it's signed? What? <laughs> I loved Vicious by V. E. Schwab. So this duology is about Victor and Eli who are friends in secondary, secondary school? University, oh my god. <laughs> They're friends in university. And they become obsessed with something called EOs, which is basically when you have a near-death experience, you basically die, brought back to life. And that leaves you with some sort of super natural, no, superhero powers. I loved Vicious. I read it on the plane to Florida and I was like, this is a new favorite. This could be one of my favorite books of the year. I'm obsessed. Went into Barnes and Noble in Florida, saw this, was like, oh my God, ah! Bought it, read it, didn't like it. That's so upsetting. So we follow Victor and Eli's story in this, but we also follow, what is her name? Maria? Marcella. We also follow Marcella's story and I felt like that was such an unnecessary thing. It wasn't engaging in the same way that Victor and Eli were. And I just thought the story would have been so much better if it had just been them. The story also felt really badly written and I don't think V. Schwab's a bad writer so like I ain't here to trash her. 
She's not gonna go there. But this was not well written, in my opinion. The pacing was horrendous, it wasn't exciting to get through. This was heartbreaking, and it really tainted Vicious for me, I suppose, also because they're a duology, it's a bit different to like, one book in a trilogy being there. Also because I read them near to each other, it just really tainted Vicious in my memory, and I'm like, well, I don't know if I like Vicious anymore. I see a lot of people don't love this as much. There's people who love it, love it, love it. But there's a few people who I've heard say the same thing as me in that treat Vicious as a standalone. Don't read Vengeful, it is not worth your time. It will just kind of taint the whole thing for you. Vicious is a perfect standalone. It didn't need this. The whole time I was reading this, I was like, why is this a thing? Like, wh why does this book exist? I still don't know. The next book that was a massive disappointment was The Hunting Party by Lucy Foley. So if you know me, I go on about it quite a bit, but I loved The Guest List by Lucy Foley. I was obsessed. But this is another murder mystery thriller. I love murder mysteries. I love Agatha Christie style murder mysteries. And this one, we find out that someone has died at this hunting lodge and it's a group of old friends. There, we have the beautiful one, the golden couple, the volatile one, the new parents, the quiet one, the city boy, the outsider, the victim. The issue with this was, and I often have to compare it to The Guest List because I felt like The Guest List is Lucy Foley's newest book. This is her one before that. And I felt like all my problems with this, I could notice had been changed and adapted in the guest list. So this is just a group of rich people who I don't like. And the same is true with the guest list, but in the guest list, you kind of have that one normal person within the type group who is able to act as your eyes into the situation. And that wasn't it here. They were all just horrible. And I don't think that worked in terms of the conflict. It also just wasn't engaging to me in terms of the characters felt very stereotypical. They felt completely one note. They didn't feel nuanced. They felt like, villains they felt like movie villains who didn't have any depth to them which was really disappointing to me considering how much i love the guest list when i read that i was like i found a new favorite author and then i read this i was like i <laughs> i do not want to comment why <laughs> why I found it predictable. I also felt like all the kind of reveals at the end, there were a lot of reveals in Lucy Foley's books. There's often like, everyone has secrets and they're all revealed. And it was just rich people problems. Like it wasn't serious problems. It was problems of their own design that they've gotten themselves into by being so privileged. And I just didn't have any sympathy for the situation. It also didn't feel like, even though we knew someone was dead, I didn't feel like any urgency in the book. I didn't feel any suspense, which you need in a mystery thriller. I just felt like the pacing was off. I felt like the structure was weird. You can already tell I didn't like it, so I don't need to go on anymore. And then the last book, which was a massive disappointment. I've seen some people agree with me. I've seen a lot of people disagree with me, but that is The Toll by Neil Shusterman. What happened in this book? So this is the third one in the Scythe series. So we have Scythe, Thunderhead, and the Toll. And the Thunderhead, again, similar to Vicious, was one of my favourite books of last year. And we follow Citra and Rowan as they are chosen to be Scythe's apprentices. In this world, you, you've probably heard about this, but I'll say it anyway. <laughs> Death is no longer possible by natural means. So Scythes are the people who have to control the population, they have to kill or glean, it's called, a certain number of people every year. And Citra and Rowan are picked to become Scythe's apprentices. And so the story goes on from there. Obviously it has a lot of layers. The Thunderhead is kind of the piece of intelligence that runs the world but it's not allowed to interfere within Scythe business. The plot and the structure of the world was perfect in the first two books. Thunderhead was incredible. And then in this book, the path that the story had been taking, in my opinion, just went out the window. It was like Neil Schusterman had a plan. And one day I was like, Dah! and just threw it out the window. And I was like, ah, oh, I'm not doing this. And so we were left with this. We met a lot of new characters who ended up playing a bigger role in this book than Citra and Rowan, which I didn't feel like made any sense at all. I just wanted to be with the characters that we knew and we'd followed for two books previous and that just didn't happen. It was also so boring <laughs> because there were some events that happened that I felt needed more build up, they needed longer within the book and they were kind of just rushed over. I feel like if Neil Schusterman was going to go this way with the plot, this needed to be a four book series and this book needed to be split in half because it just felt incredibly rushed and didn't have the nuance and the complexity that the first two books had. I decided to give up. 
So it left you bored because you weren't getting the quality and the depth that you wanted and needed for certain things to be interesting. I didn't have a problem with the ending. I just felt like the way it got there was really weird. And I was really disappointed by it. I am interested in reading Neil Shusterman stuff in the future because I really love his writing. But this ending to the series, I just felt like was a massive letdown. Something that had been built up and everything had been set in stone so well for then us to just get rid of certain characters, not pay attention to them, ignore them. Made no sense to me. So wasn't a fan. So there we have it. That is the most disappointing books that I've read. I hated these books. And there's some of them are so popular it actually kills me. <laughs> Let me know down below what some of the most disappointing books you have read are. Thank you so much as always for watching. The support on this channel recently has just been incredible and I feel like the luckiest gal in the world. I kind of want to engage, I want to say something now that will make those of you who never comment. Like, because I used to be that girl back before I had a channel. I would watch booktube, but I never commented. And I want to connect with you. So maybe comment, like, comment your favorite animal emoji if you have watched to here. Just because I know sometimes it can be difficult to think of a comment and you're like, oh, I don't know what to say. But I just want to see some of your faces and know you. So comment an animal emoji, your favourite animal. Mine's the warthog. I love a good warthog emoji. <laughs> and thank you so much for watching as always. I will see you very soon with another video. Bye.